Welcome back, strangers. Loyola University, New Orleans is a private Jesuit Catholic university that was originally established in 1904 and became a university in 1912. The school has a long history of paranormal activity that includes ghosts, nuns, and even an exorcism. Today, we're going to discuss the strange hauntings at Loyola University, New Orleans. The final one is the most famous and begs the question, could a demonic entity make its home inside a Catholic university? Marquette Hall is the centerpiece of Loyola's campus. The building looks almost like a castle. It's the oldest permanent building on campus and was constructed between 1907 and 1910. Most classes originally took place in Marquette until the completion of other buildings. It was then used as a library until the 1950s. Today, Marquette is mostly used as an administrative building, except for a few classes that are still conducted in the old castle. The main theater used by the theater arts program is on the third floor. Many students and faculty have seen strange apparitions inside, causing many to believe it's haunted. Numerous ghost sightings occur in the theater's balcony. During rehearsal one night in 1967, the stage manager saw something that scared him so much that he immediately left. Some who have seen the apparition claim it's of a woman in all white and with black stringy hair who is often seen overlooking the stage from the right hand side of the balcony. The stage has what has become known as the ghost light, a light the theater department always leaves on for safety purposes, but legend says it's really left on for the woman in white to perform under when no one else is around. From 1916 to the 1960s, the fourth floor of Marquette was used to dissect cadavers. A crane outside the building was used to hoist the bodies to the fourth floor, where the campus morgue and laboratories were located. The students and classes on the lower floors of Marquette became accustomed to the loud groaning ropes and screeching pulleys when the cadavers were being taken up by the crane. Today, people in the building at night often complain of hearing the same high-pitched creaking sounds of the old crane bringing the bodies up to the fourth floor despite the crane not being used in decades. Temperatures in Marquette are known to drastically fluctuate, lights will flicker, and the doors will randomly open and slam on their own. There is another ghost on campus that likes to perform in the Nunemaker Auditorium in Monroe Hall. The building was built in 1969 and is used for classes, concerts, and lectures. There have been numerous reports of the sound of someone playing a piano or organ after the auditorium has been locked for the night and is empty. Security guards have reported hearing the music, but when they unlock the auditorium to investigate, the music stops and no one is inside the auditorium. Greenville Hall was built in 1889 and is part of Loyola's Broadway campus that was purchased in 1984. Before, the campus was a part of St. Mary's Dominican College, a liberal arts college for women. Originally, the school was founded by the Dominican Sisters Congregation of St. Mary as an academy for women. Eventually, the school was split into the St. Mary's Dominican High School and the Women's College that was chartered in 1910. The campus was built on an old plantation that was annexed by the city of New Orleans in the late 1800s. For decades, Greenville Hall has had many legends and hauntings dating back to when it was still part of the campus of St. Mary's Dominican College. At the top of Greenville Hall sits a cupola, a small dome that holds a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Legend has it that long ago a pregnant nun hung herself from the cupola and now she's doomed to wander the halls of Greenville for all eternity. There are rumors of underground passageways that connect Greenville Hall to other buildings on the Broadway campus. Supposedly, human bones can be found in the old underground passages that are presumably from babies that were either killed or abandoned there by past students to avoid scandalous affairs. It is said that the nuns would remind the girls staying in Greenville not to forget to say their prayers at night. The prayers were meant to ward off a banshee that had been repeatedly seen and heard on campus since before it was a plantation. The banshee is a supernatural being who takes the form of an old woman and foretells death by singing or wailing outside. Students, faculty, and security guards have reported seeing and hearing strange things occur inside of Greenville. Many hear disembodied voices, unexplained footsteps, and mysterious apparitions appearing and disappearing into the shadows at night. Could it be the spirit of the doomed nun who hung herself, the wailing banshee, or the ghosts of the innocent unwanted babies whose bones supposedly littered the underground passages of Greenville Hall? Buttick Hall is a first year and upperclassman residence hall. It's 12 stories and is the tallest building on campus. It was named after Henrietta Buttig and can accommodate over 400 students. 
The residence may be the center of all paranormal activity on campus. The 10th floor of the building is rumored to be haunted. The students hear strange noises, footsteps, and disembodied voices. Toilets flush on their own, and doors will mysteriously open and shut. But these incidences do not compare to the disturbing events that occurred in room 813. Before the Exorcist novel came out in 1971, and the film in 1973 that ignited the country's fascination with demonic possession, a minor exorcism was performed at Loyola in 1968. Two freshmen, Marie and Brenda, staying in room 813, began playing with a Ouija board nightly. The girl sweetmates, Janet and Dorothea, would often come watch and join in the innocent fun. Dorothea was skeptical of the board until the girls contacted a spirit named Hazel that said she was a Creole woman from New Orleans whose husband passed away in prison for a crime he didn't commit. After that encounter, the girls became obsessed with the board. One day, the girls took the board over to a boy named Neil's room in Beaver Hall and Hazel spelled out, cut stomach, kill Neil, on the board. The next day, Neil had terrible stomach cramps and collapsed in the cafeteria. He was rushed to the hospital and it was discovered he was suffering from acute appendicitis. The doctors cut his stomach and removed Neil's appendix and he made a full recovery. After that incident, the board began spelling out stranger and more sinister things. It started repeatedly spelling that it was an evil spirit. It kept specifically asking for Marie to use the board so the spirit could possess her. Yet the girls couldn't stop playing with it. Each time they put it down, swearing never to use it again, one of them would eventually end up using it. They were drawn to it. Finally, Hazel stopped answering them. A new spirit began communicating to them. When they asked who they were speaking to, the board would spell out Satan repeatedly, but the girls didn't trust it. They asked for proof that it was truly the Prince of Darkness. The lights went out and a blue flame appeared over Brenda's head. Her face appeared blue and a strange outline of a demonic face with eyes, nose, and a mouth smiling a large satanic grin came over her. The girls immediately consulted Reverend Harold Cohen, the Associate Director of Campus Ministry, about their interaction with an evil spirit that they believed to be a demon or Satan himself. Reverend Cohen told the girls to stop using the board and see if anything else happened. Again, the girls couldn't leave the board alone. They kept going back to it like dogs who returned to their vomit, each time contacting the spirit that called himself Satan. Then, at 2 a.m., several weeks later, Brenda and Marie woke up to strange noises in their room. Objects began flying off the shelves and their beds began moving back and forth on their own. Posters flew off the walls and ashtrays shattered on the ground. Finally, at 3.30 a.m., everything stopped, and they called Reverend Cohen, who came and performed an exorcism on room 813. He sprinkled holy water throughout the room and said prayers in Latin. The Reverend had the girls and their suite mates line up in the room and say prayers with him to protect them and the room from the unknown forces of evil that the girls had opened themselves up to. This ended the strange events for the girls that year. They finally got rid of the Ouija board and stopped trying to communicate with unworldly spirits. Yet many think there is still some sort of lingering presence in 813. The room has a history of hostility between roommates. Students staying in the room often drop out, and sometimes items fly across the room for no reason. Occasionally, students living in 813 will come back from class and find everything rearranged in their room. When the room is empty, suite mates will still occasionally report strange noises coming from inside. Would you be brave enough to spend a semester in room 813? Thanks strangers for watching. Which story from Loyola creeped you out the most? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to leave a like and share this video with a friend if you enjoyed it. Subscribe and smash that bell button so you never miss out on one of our videos, and also check out our side channel where we're posting gaming videos daily. And as always, stay strange.